Amen. Let's open our Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. It's a great chapter in the Bible. 2 Corinthians 5. The anchor holds in spite of the storm. Now, we've been talking about storm proof, and one of the things that we determined early on in this series is you can't, you can't keep a storm from happening. It's what do you do when the storm comes and how that looks. And doesn't mean when you're storm proof, you can avoid all problems. However, that doesn't mean that we keep trying, do not, do not try to organize our lives in such a way that we will never have difficulty. And to illustrate this, I started down a path and I'm going to take you down this dark path with me because, see, I grew up in a time when many things that are now uh, off limits were absolutely on the table. And I want to give you some examples of this. We got some pictures. Any of you ever have these? Yeah, yeah, I did. They went by different names depending on who the manufacturer was, but it's like a hard plastic balls on the end of this string, and you, you, you moved them up and down, and the balls would come together and hit each other. And if you got going fast enough, they'd go bang, 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 until they exploded and put your eye out. Because this hard plastic would always break at some point. It was a terribly dangerous uh, toy and uh, taken off the market many years ago. There you go. Okay, next picture. Okay, so this is, uh, those of you who are parents now, uh, crib safety is a big deal, absolutely. And cribs have changed a lot through the years. This is basically a guillotine and uh, dangerous in every imaginable way, not only to the child, but also to the parents because it'd take a finger off just about. Okay. Okay. How many of you? Ever ran or rode a bike behind the DDT machine? Yeah, there we go. That explains a lot, doesn't it? Yeah, me too. They'd, they'd spray that stuff, and it was, it was to get rid of mosquitoes, you know, but kids, they just, woo hoo hoo just like those kids. Uh, yeah, nothing better for you than that. Okay. Everybody in the front seat, no seat belts. That's the way life went. Yeah, that's changed a lot. Okay, next one up, hitchhiking. I was a sophomore in high school, and we were on a youth trip, and our church bus broke down between Schulenburg and LaGrange. We were just a few miles out of Schulenburg, and so our youth minister, he said, well, I got to stay here with the other kids, but uh, he sent me and another guy from our youth group. He said, hey, see if you got, because nobody has a cell phone, so we're just trapped out there, and we're still pretty good ways from Victoria. Hey, could you guys just hitchhike into Schulenburg, see if you can make a call back to the church in Victoria? And, and uh, so we hitchhiked into Schulenburg, found some sucker who would pick us up, bring us back, and safety first, right? Okay. Yard darts. Yeah, you say you're throwing those things at that circle, but it didn't take long until you were throwing them at each other. Or, okay, next... Uh, <laughs> yeah, how many of you bear marks on your body from being thrown through the air off of one of those uh, weird things? You just, you had friends that would see how fast can they go to make it spin, and you're just hanging on, and eventually you're just going to go flinging off into the, into the atmosphere somewhere. Uh, yeah, we had those in, at our school, in elementary school, and uh, they were a hazard in every imaginable way. Sometimes you just bounced around between those bars. Okay. No helmets for those kids, right? Oh, yeah. No helmets, no elbow pads, no knee pads. How many of you bear on your body the scars of a bicycle wreck? Here? 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 Yeah, I have permanent scars riding a bicycle and only minimal brain damage. School's out. It's kids, if you're walking two miles, just... Good luck to you. You know, there are not many kids walking to school anymore. Everybody picks up, drops off, but, oh, yeah, you just wander around. I'd, my mom would make sure I had something for breakfast, and then she'd just turn me loose in the summer, and I'd see her at lunch, and then I'd disappear again down some creek bed or something else, and, yeah, just out wandering the, wandering the world by ourselves. Okay. <laughs> How many of you have ever slept in the back window of a car? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Safety first. 
Okay, what else we got here? Okay, this is a little more hidden for some of you, but you know the best cereal is little granules of sugar in some milk, which is basically what most, most cereals were for a long time. Uh, yeah, so that little girl, she doesn't have to worry about losing her baby teeth because they're going to rot out. <laughs> okay, next up. Yeah, that was in the back of that merry-go-round picture because they often went as a tandem of, of destruction. So uh, Jeff and I, we grew up in Victoria, and Riverside Park in Victoria had one of these slides. It was just that monster slide. There's just one thing about this slide that's different from most of them that I've ever been on like this. It's in the shade. <laughs> so how many of you have ever gotten third-degree burns riding down to the end of that thing yeah oh man oh man oh man when we were in Stanford out in West Texas they still had one of those and I let my kids own it you know because I'm a terrible parent okay yeah not all not all toys are safe toys and what what's wrong with this particular put your eye out yes that's what will happen with that BB gun Red Rider BB gun okay and then yeah, drinking out of a water hose. My mother just say, you're not coming in here, you filthy animal. You stay out there and you get you a drink out of that water hose, out of that lead pipe water hose. That'd be good for you. Yeah, we, we're not supposed to do that anymore, according to the experts. Okay, so here's what we tried to do. We have tried in every imaginable way to keep ourselves safe. And really based on the pictures, there's some things we should have done a long time before to keep ourselves safe, to protect our... But here's what, here's what happens. We say, okay, I'm going to bubble wrap my kids so nothing can ever go bad for them. They're going to be so protected, so shielded. I can insulate them from all harm. We buy alarm systems. We have video surveillance equipment at our homes. We'll buy a gun. We'll get a lot of insurance. We'll carry our cell phone with all kinds of gadgetry on that thing to keep us safe from everything. We'll give it to our kids at a very early age so we can track them. And they're always available to us wherever they are, whatever they're doing. And multiple warnings about weather and apps to keep us up to date on anything that might happen or might be happening somewhere. Now, is it possible to avoid all things? It is not. Came across this in a blog article. This guy said, you know, we think we can be the exception to the rule. Like, yeah, bad things are going to happen to other people, but not to me. I can somehow be the exception. And they said, we forget how temporary this life is. And we tend to live as if nothing's ever going to change. And it's weird that it does. It's weird. It's unusual. It's out of character, out of context that, that bad things happen to people. We think that everything's just going to keep going as it always has. And it's never going to get harder. It's never going to get more difficult. We think we'll always have tomorrow. But every now and then, reality breaks through. And we see our lives for what they really are. James in the uh, New Testament wrote a little letter that bears his name and James wrote James 4 you do not know what tomorrow will bring what your life will be for you're like a vapor that appears for a little while then vanishes one uh, author picked this up out of a, from a reading one of my books I was reading told about Walking by a cemetery, seeing gravestones overturned and unkept, some of the sites. And he's walking with his wife. And I enjoy walking through, a, through old cemeteries, reading gravestones, because I'm just that kind of party animal, I guess. But uh, I was in an old uh, cemetery uh, last week, and old, old uh, grave sites. And this guy's wife noted, do you realize that the people buried here looked at their lives like we look at ours? They never imagined how short and insignificant their lives would be. Most of them thought they'd be remembered forever, but look at them. And in, she said, in their case, remember their great-great-grandchildren don't even remember their names, kind of like the old book I have there. We're here today, gone tomorrow. So when we face pain, suffering, illness, loss, and, and we say when, not if, because those things are going to come to everyone's life if you're around long enough, because the world is broken, the curse of sin marks our lives, marks our world, the creation itself just reminds us this is not heaven. This world cannot be 
forced to be heaven where everything's perfect and everything's wonderful because sin has forever changed that story. We can't make it heaven. I want to, before I get to the, first, the second Corinthians passage, I want to read this from Romans 8 because it's almost a parallel passage as Paul writes to the Romans and says, this is a great verse, the first one, verse 18. For I consider the sufferings of the present time are not worth comparing with the glory that's going to be revealed to us. He says, no matter how, how hard life is here, there is going to so far outweigh anything here, it won't, it won't even be comparable. For the creation, he says, it's, not just, it's not just us that want it to change, us to make it, we, we want it to be better, but the creation itself eagerly waits with anticipation for God's sons to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in the hope that the creation itself will also be set free from the bondage to decay into the glorious freedom of God's children. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together with labor pains until now. Not only that, but we ourselves, who have the Spirit as the first fruits, we also groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. So here's the question I want to try to take on today. and This is actually part one of a two-part sermon. And next week, uh, we'll take on part two. And uh, I'll, I'm going to do a significant portion of uh, personal testimony next Sunday. And I encourage you, many of you have been asking about me and uh, some of the struggles I've had, my vision and I'm going to give you the, the up-to-date, kind of how that journey has run for me. And uh, that's, uh, that's the part two of this, is we'll kick off a new series from the Psalms. Uh, each Psalm, each Sunday we'll take on a Psalm and uh, talk about God's people singing through whatever life brings. So here's, uh, here's what we have. How do you suffer well? If it's going to come, pain, difficulty, challenges, illness loss it's going to come so how do you learn to do that well if, if something is absolutely going to happen in your life uh, you certainly ought to prepare for it and that's easy to answer in theory I can give you a philosophy of religion answer to that it's a lot harder in practical application to suffer well to suffer in a Christ honoring way especially when suffering just crashes into your existence and so for me, just this stage of my life, I've suffered with physical pain and some setbacks, certainly some loss. And sometimes you do wonder, I've had this conversation with plenty of people, you ever, is it okay just to be angry about it? Is it okay to be angry with God about it? Cry out to God? The psalmists certainly did, and that gives me encouragement. When's it right to ask God for just deliverance? God, I want you to... I want complete healing. I want to, I'm asking for a miracle. I'm asking for you to undo what is, what is broken. Deliver me from trial. And when it doesn't work that way, how do you continue to have joy and continue to have peace and continue to press forward in a Christ-like way? What about even facing our own mortality with hope, courage? Courage. My, was, I think it was another blog article. The story, this guy told the story that early on in his life, he went to work at a funeral home, and they were teaching him how to care for families and pre-planning and care for families through the grief process and all those things at the funeral home. And he said, you know, part of this is it is a business, so part of the training was how to make an effective sales presentation, overcome objections, close the deal with the family. And he said one suggestion surprised him. If they say they need some time to discuss it, like, okay, here's, here's what pre-planning looks like. I need some time to discuss it. Just ask them, how long has it been since they've had a serious talk in their family about death? He said their answer to the question will prove that although death is one of the inescapable realities of our existence, most people never discuss it. That's absolutely true. The Apostle Paul knew and address the hardships of earthly life. And he wasn't afraid to talk about death and, and what comes after death. God's word covers the full scope of our existence. 
And 2 Corinthians 5 has just been really helpful to me in all kinds of ways, and I hope it's going to be helpful to you. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1 says this, For we know, we know, that if our earthly tent, this little body here, we live in is destroyed. We have a building from God, an eternal dwelling in the heavens, not made with hands. Indeed, we groan in this tent, desiring to put on our heavenly dwelling, since when we've taken it off, we'll not be found naked. Indeed, we groan while we are in this tent, burdened as we are, because we don't want to be unclothed, but clothed, so that mortality may be swallowed up by life. Now, the one who prepared us for this very purpose is God, who gave us the Spirit as a down payment. For we're always confident and know that while we're at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. In fact, we're confident that we would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. Boy, that is an eternal, Christ-like Christ-honoring kind of perspective, and it is hard to get to there. Let's see if we can take a few steps that direction. Paul reminds us it is possible to have courage when you suffer, when you experience loss, when you're in pain, when you're in a journey of pain, not just pain in a moment, pain in a crisis, but long-term to find hope and peace and joy. And all that because we are clinging to the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ, and in our suffering, that is the one anchor that holds. So four things from this passage you want to touch on. Here's the first one. Be encouraged. Be encouraged because heaven's coming. Paul begins in verse 1 reminding the Corinthians. He said, we know. And they do. We just need to be reminded of stuff. I need a regular reminder of key things from the Word of God. He says, we know, we know because he's already talked to him about it. First Corinthians, he went into great detail about this story. So he's just saying, hey, I'm just, I'm just throwing this out to you again. Don't forget this. You say, oh, yes, I understand there's a theological concept. Now I'm in the battle. Now it's fallen down on me, and, and I've forgotten. He said, we know that these things are true. He doesn't have to review it with them. He's taught them these truths before. These human bodies, and he talks about, this is a temporary shelter. This thing, this, this thing wasn't made to last forever. It, it, in fact, it's, it's going to break down. It's going to fall apart. It's going to not work as well as it used to. Back in chapter 4 of 2 Corinthians, he referred to bodies again as jars of clay. Just not permanent, not strong, fragile this life here is coming to a close, and uh, death is out there. Death rate in the world, 100%. One day, one day though, we will behold the return of Jesus Christ on the clouds of glory to restore all things. And this is our hope. On that day, the earthly tent transformed into an indestructible dwelling place. Our souls fully restored the curse of sin wiped away, freed from sin's grip, glorified, complete. Well, that's out there. How does that out there affect me today in the difficulties that I face and the struggles that I have? How does it give me courage right now? Well, it motivates me to place my ultimate hope in eternal things which last forever and ever instead of this life that, that lasts for these years. That I'm not putting my hope in my present circumstances. And that's why people begin to despair because they say, I want it all to be perfect right now. I want it all to work great right now. I want everything to be happy right now. And not in our present circumstances, not in thinking, well, it's bad right now, but it's always going to get better because it's not getting better. It's going to get harder. There are going to be some bigger things out there. Even if, even if I am never granted release from my current afflictions, I have gained in Christ because I have this future home purchased. I am redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ, and my hope is there, and that carries me between here wherever here is, however here feels, here, and that glorious eternity that's waiting for me.
Here's the second thing. Be encouraged because of freedom in prayer. And I like the raw, the raw nature of how Paul says this. He said it in Romans 8. He says it now in 2 Corinthians 5. He says, we groan. And it's not just, you know, growling about what I don't like, what doesn't come work out the way I want to. His, his vision is a lot bigger than that, a lot more sweeping than that. It's, it's groaning and crying out to the Lord. We groan in this tent desiring to put on our heavenly dwelling. That we know this, this is so temporary. And I'm, sometimes I start, I, I, more and more I start looking forward to the dwelling that is to come. To the permanent that is to come. Our ultimate hope of eternity with Christ. And it manifests itself right now, we would pray. And this is the way to lean into this. In a confident Prayer to the Father who knows our needs. He hears our request and he delights to bless, encourage, strengthen, and guide. Uh, sometimes I have, this is one of my struggles in my struggles. I have wondered, is it okay to, uh, to keep crying out for deliverance? You know, Paul had his thorn in the flesh and he... Uh, he said he prayed three times, God delivered him from it. God said, my grace is sufficient for you. And he said, okay, well, I'm, I'm saddling up. If this is the, if this is the, this is the route I'm going to take, I am going to keep on doing the best I can with what I've got. Is it okay to keep calling out for healing, call, calling out? Or should I, like Paul, learn to be content in whatever my circumstances? To say, I, I'm trusting the Lord for the journey that he has entrusted to me, and I'm going to do this journey well and uh, the answer is both. Paul did both. Groaning in prayer pleases God, I think. Calling out to God in prayer, there's a whole lot of good in that. Because if we're praying, we're humbling ourselves before God. And that, that opens up some key parts of us that really only God can, can change. And he needs to be doing some changing, some growing in us through that. Suffering breaks down a couple things. It breaks down our self-will. The self-will says, it has to be my way. It's got to be according to my plan. Life has to, I've charted this path. and It's not working the way I think God should do it. When we start groaning in prayer, calling out to God, God, please make this different, this relationship different, this, this health, my health different, my, my pain different. It starts breaking down my self-will the more time I spend with the Lord, the more he starts reforming me and reshaping me. It also breaks down my self-sufficiency. This part of the world, we're pretty self-sufficient folk. We, uh, we have enough insurance, got enough money, have enough resources, enough doctors. We can run a long time just trying to do it ourselves. When I get to that spot in prayer, it starts breaking down. Okay, I've come to the end of me. When you're groaning in prayer, you say, I'm recognizing I have nowhere to turn but God. And why would I want to turn anywhere else anyway? And what took me so long to get to full faith in Him? It just starts revealing some of our, our weaknesses. It, it reveals that, that pride reveals our sin and it reveals our need for a Redeemer. We walk by faith, not by sight. It also testifies that we have freedom as God's children to ask and to ask big. Uh, our requests sweeping, deliverance from trouble, and we can approach the throne of grace with confidence because of Jesus Christ. When you've given your life to Christ, you've said, I put all my faith in Jesus who died on the cross for me, was raised from the dead, I surrender my life to him as my king, my master, my Lord. You make that commitment, you begin that relationship. You're a child of God, and you have access to your Father in heaven, direct access, and by the blood of Jesus. And it expresses, that groaning just expresses, we long to be with him. Increasingly more like him. And temporary comforts and escape from trouble are not our biggest desire. But we groan to be completely passionately set free temporary deliverance keep praying for it eternal restoration have faith in it it's both in 
Third thing, be encouraged because God uses suffering, difficulty, pain, loss as preparation for glory. Preparation for glory. Life is preparation for eternity. This is the opportunity we have to come to know Christ, to serve Him, to love Him, and what we do here as a follower of Christ determines a lot about what we get to do in heaven. That makes every day important. Because we're God's children, all things are working together for our good, and all things are working together for His glory. We know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love Him, who've been called according to His purpose. The older I get, the less I understand about God's purpose. About, I understand the big sweeping, He's moving in this direction. I understand the flow of uh, eternal history. But why God does things the way He does, His timing in things, so much more a mystery that I just embrace by faith that God is wiser than I am. He knows things I do not know. And we choose to say, I'm going to cling to His love because where else will I turn? I've seen people who say, well, God failed me. God let me down. God didn't do everything I wanted him to do the way I wanted him to do it in the timing I wanted him to do it in. Therefore, I'm turning away from God. Where will you go to have hope, to have strength? There's nowhere else to turn except the eternal one. And he loves you, and he proved that forever. It is so true, and it is hard, and I, and I go back and revisit it. If he never does anything for me the way I want him to, if life never follows the path I want life to follow, I will never doubt his love for me because of what he did at the cross. And if he never does anything besides what he did for me at the cross, it is enough to say he loves me. He loves you. The reason we're able to be of good courage in the middle of our pain is a firm belief in God's love for us, expressed in the gospel. Confidence, uh, dropping back to that uh, previous chapter, chapter 4, for our momentary light affliction, and his was a whole lot more than we wouldn't call what he was experiencing light. Our momentary light affliction is producing for us an absolute, incomparable, eternal weight of glory. Whatever you face in this life, it just magnifies how much greater, how much more beautiful, how much more complete will be our experience with our Lord in heaven. Now, this concern Paul feels about our future resurrected bodies as believers, uh, he's focused on the eternal state of our heavenly bodies, not not the current body, not the intermediate state. And again, he's broken this out in 1 Corinthians. He touches on it here too. And so he's looking at the eternal state eternal body that will be ours as a follower of Jesus Christ. So let's give you a breakdown of what that's like, what that resurrected body is like. Jesus was physically resurrected. Again, he, he's not just a, a spirit floating around. Jesus had a bodily resurrection. It's a key doctrine of God's word. And we will be bodily resurrected, not just Spirits turning around, just floating around. We're not going to be just uh, the Looney Tunes angel strumming a harp, sitting on a cloud uh, and transparent. A physical body. We're told that our bodies will be like His in 1 Corinthians and Philippians and 1 John. See, after the resurrection, remember, Jesus invited His disciples to touch Him. He said, look at my hands and feet, that it is I myself... Touch me and see, because a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. Bodily resurrected, as physical as we are today, but in a much improved version of that body. We see the things Jesus was able to do. How he moved, how he appeared in different places, and we will have a body, the Bible says, like his. Christ's physical resurrected body is the model for our resurrected bodies on a resurrected earth. Not ghosts, physical human beings. We will live forever after the final rebellion and judgment in resurrected bodies in the new heaven, new earth. Now, when God speaks about us having a new body, some people, well, what's that going to be like? We can't even imagine what that's going to be like. Well, sure we can. How many of you have a body right now? 
Okay, that's about half of you. Yeah, yeah, everybody's got a body. You know what a body's like. But to have one that is not just a temporary tent, but that permanent dwelling place, a gift from the Lord, that's a different kind of world. Yeah, you know what a body's like. We've had one most of my life. We can imagine a new body, except without pain, without weakness, without illness, where everything, uh, we're not past our peak, we're raised to new life in a new body on a new earth, and that beyond wildest imagination. Our resurrected bodies will be as physical as we are now, and after the new earth is established and we're relocated there, we will be forever physical, but no longer subject to sin, to death, to suffering, to the curse that sin brought to this world and to lives. Christ you remember Jesus grew up in a carpenter's home. Christ is a carpenter. Carpenters in the first century, they, they built things, but they did a whole lot of fixing of things. Do your body, does your body, your mind, your spirit, your heart, you need some fixing? It's all going to be fixed. He's going to fix the universe itself. And don't underestimate God's plan of Christ's redemptive work. He created us. He created our bodies. He created this earth. And he hasn't given up on us. He hasn't given up on our bodies. And he hasn't given up on this earth. And he's committed to repairing them permanently. The nail prints, Jesus' hands and feet. It's the clearest, uh, strongest possible affirmation. It's the same earthly body. There's some things that carry over, whatever that's going to be for any of us. But Jesus said, look at my hands, look at my feet, the nail prints in his hands, in his feet. A little while we're going to sing, put your hand in the nail scarred hand of Jesus. There are things that carry over that we are still us. We still have identity as us, yet, yet complete, uh, redeemed, purified by the blood of Christ. This earthly body of uh, Jesus crucified the same heavenly body raised look at my hands and feet this is I myself touch me and see because a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have now some people believe oh I believe that uh, and there are whole books written about this stuff everyone uh, every believer in the resurrection they're going to have they're going to be 30 years old because that's how old Jesus was when he was raised from the dead so we're all going to be 30 years old some people say well it depends on how people knew you when you look at someone that you knew when they were very old, you'll see them as old. When you knew somebody when they were young, they'll, you'll see them as young. Well, theoretical theology is a waste of time and energy. And there's a lot of it that we do. Just say, well, there are 20 different views on this. Here are the 20 different views. And you're spinning your wheels on things that don't matter for eternity when you start doing that. Here's what we do know. We will be who we are and based on uh, several different things, we'll be recognizable in heaven. Still us but the right kind of us, a Christ-like kind of us. And then fourth thing, be encouraged. Because of the Holy Spirit's presence and promise, the Holy Spirit, and again, that Romans 8 passage hit this, so does 2 Corinthians 5. Paul reminds us that our Father has given us the Spirit as a guarantee uh, of our, ho our house, not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. That the Holy Spirit is like a down payment. When you give your life to Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes to reside in you. And uh, you, you walk in relationship with the Holy Spirit in your life. And it's like, okay, you're still going to have difficulties. You're still going to have pain. You're still going to experience loss. But you have the Holy Spirit in you just to remind you, a down payment, a guarantee, uh, an assurance that there's another life coming and another land that is out there before us. He's a good deposit on our future heavenly home secured in Christ. And even in our sufferings, his presence and promise strengthen us to endure, to grow spiritually, to mature, and to always be a hope-filled people. The Spirit calls to mind, it's just, this is the beginning and end of all things doctrine of the Holy Spirit, but here are some of the things the Spirit does. Calls to mind the, the Word of God. The truth of God's word just comes off the page, is illuminated in life circumstances. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. The Holy Spirit convicts us of sin, convicts us of righteousness, convicts us of judgment. The Holy Spirit pours the love of Christ into our hearts. 
The Spirit enables us to respond to suffering as Christ responded to suffering. Again, we follow the one who suffered and died on a cross. We should not be surprised, the Bible says, if we suffer, if we have difficulty, if we experience pain uh, in this life. How did Jesus respond? It takes the Spirit's power to respond in prayer, in dependence on Him, in trust in His un- God's uh, unseen or, mis- or just hard to understand plan. And is suffering well? Well, this will push you in spiritual growth. We wouldn't grow at all if we didn't have to go through difficulty in life. And God takes us down some paths because His ultimate goal is not to make life easy, carefree, and problem all solved here. He wants to make us like his son Jesus and he is forming us for a heavenly reality that is so much more real than anything this earth in its sin-stained form offers. Pursuit of good courage in affliction is worth the fight. I didn't read verses 9 and 10. I'm going to read those now. Therefore, whether we are at home or away, here or there, We make it our aim to be pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that we may be repaid for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Someday I'm going to stand before Jesus. Justified by grace through faith, that incredible gift. And I just know, I don't want to encourage you in this. I just know that when I stand before God, I I want to have done it well. In all the details of it and to have learned what he wants me to learn, to be formed in the way he wants to form me so that when I stand before him, I'll hear, well done, good and faithful servant. And I don't want less than that. And I don't want less for that than you. Be of good courage. You are not alone in this. One of the reasons we we gather up like this, we group up, we church, is because we need each other to do this well. You just need other people to encourage and help and pray and walk with you. And that's why we do it together. And I'm glad we're in it together.